this is a great idea. Thanks, Dad. Do you think 35000 will be enough to get you started? I, I don't want a loan. It's not a loan, son. It's a gift. I believe in you, son. I love you. I love you, too. I'll pay you back. I promise. I just need, like... 3500 bucks to get me through the next couple of months. You know I'm good for it. Well, let me take a moment to welcome all of our North Star campuses as well as all of you who are joining us online. We're very, very excited that you're with us today here at North Star, and we are continuing in a series that we've been in over the past three weeks together entitled uh, The Ideal Family. Now, I know that most of you, when you saw that video, were probably laughing because, you know, there's this tension between the real and the ideal, and that's what we've been talking about and what we're going to continue to talk about over the next few weeks. In fact, uh, the very first week, one of the things that I tried to help each and every one of us understand is that there is this tension between what is real and what is ideal. You see, what is real is that maybe some of you today are sitting here and you're going through a divorce. Uh, for some of you, maybe you're on your second marriage and it doesn't seem like it's going to work out. For some of you, maybe you're newlyweds and you know uh, you thought it was going to be a lot easier than it is and it's a lot harder than you thought that it was going to be. For some of you, uh, it, when it comes to kids, like you're, you're trying to have kids and some of us have kids and our kids, they're not obeying and doing the things that we want them to do and so we find ourselves living inside of the real, the reality of what happens every day in our homes and with our families. And then we talked about the ideal that Jesus had this standard that he taught. And the standard that Jesus taught was a standard that he wanted every single one of us to aim for. And he wanted every single one of us not to back away from the ideal, even though we are living in the real. And therein is where the tension lies because we deal with the real every day. We see the ideal, we know what it is. And we aren't necessarily living the ideal. And any time we're not living the ideal, that is when we begin to find ourselves in tension. In fact, the very first week we said this. We said Jesus taught and pointed towards an ideal, yet refused to condemn those who fell short. And so Jesus basically was the guy who, who held up the standard. He said, here's the standard, but he understood that not every single one of us would be able to live up to the standard. And the question we asked and that we're continuing to ask is, do we back away from the standard? Do you want less for your kids than you yourself have had inside of your marriage and in the relationships that you have in your life? Or are you going to hold up the ideal for your kids and for your grandkids to say, hey, this is the ideal, this is what we should strive for, this is what every one of us are trying to what accomplish in our life because we want to have the ideal family. And then last week, we talked about conflict. We talked about how every single family has conflict and how are we to deal with that conflict. And if you remember, I simply taught you this principle, this, this, this question. We said, hey, where do fights and arguments come from? And we said the next time that you find yourself at the place that you're living in this tension and you, you feel like all of a sudden there's going to be an argument that you just stop for a moment and say, hey, you know what part of the problem is here? I'm not getting what I want. Now, here's what's interesting, all right? Uh, this week, I had a couple of men say to me, they said, you know, Pastor Marty, I love that question. Like, you know, I, I mean, it's just amazing. But, but I, I want to ask you a question. Is it okay for me in the middle of the argument or when I feel the tension rising to look at her and to say, you know what the problem is? You're not getting what you want. And I was like, no, it's not okay. In fact, two days later when your eyes open up, you come back and let me know how that worked out for you. This is about you, not about the other person. And here's what we were saying. We were simply saying that each and every one of us, we live inside of this tension that often there are conflicts in our relationships. 
And we just simply, if we step back for just a moment, what James said is James said, any time there is tension, it is because you have these desires and wants on the inside of you, and you aren't getting what you want, and when you don't get what you want, then what happens is, is there is conflict and an argument that ensues. And we said, the way that you deal with conflict is you simply step back and you ask the question, hey, what is it that I want? What is it that I want? And then you take it to God. You ask God to reveal your motives. And then you deal with the conflict or you have the conversation. And so we basically summarized everything in the first week by saying this. We said that when you look at the New Testament, here is a summary of the family, right? Here's a summary. This is the ideal that, that basically husbands, you're to love your wives and to be considerate. Wives, you're to submit to your husbands and children. You're to obey your parents. And fathers, do not irritate your children. And we said, this is the ideal, but we live with the real. But are we going to back away from the ideal? Do we want less for our kids and less for our grandkids than the ideal? And we would say, no, no, we don't want less than that. And we want to hold the ideal up. Now, today, we're going to deal with one, 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 one verse that probably is the most politically incorrect, that raises more questions and more tension. And in fact, uh, women don't like this verse, all right? Do any of y'all know what verse that is, all right? Let, let me just go ahead and say today, we're going to talk about wives submit to husbands. In fact, Paul wrote about this. Now, I want you to stay with me just for a second, because if you remember in the very first week, here's what we said. I want to just show you the verse. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, with the word submit, all right, the, the concept and the idea of submit, anytime people come in for counseling, I told you this a couple of weeks ago, it's always amazing to me how the men want to bring up this verse. Pastor Marty, you know that verse in Ephesians that talks about submit? And I'm like, yes, I know that verse in Ephesians that talks about submit. But let me ask you a question, ladies. This is what I, I say to men. What is the first word or the second word in this passage of scripture, let's say it out loud together. What is that word? Wives, right? Some of y'all are scared. I ain't gonna say that out loud. My wife just sitting beside me. No, let's say it again. What's the word there? What? Wives, right? And here's what I say to men. There are other verses that talk about you, that talk about you as a husband. And why don't you let her focus on the verse that focuses, uh, talks about her and you focus on the verse that, fo that focuses on you? Now, ladies, I've got your back, all right? And, and, and I do this in counseling. In fact, that's why a lot of people don't come to me in counseling because I'm like, hey, you need to focus on what you need to focus on. You've got to work on what you need to work on because you are, are, are the one that maybe has some problems that, that you need to focus on and deal with. And she may be struggling in an area that, that she needs to focus on and deal with, but you let her focus on those verses and you focus on those verses. And guys, here's what's important to understand. What most of us don't even know is that as Paul was teaching this passage of Scripture, this was an application to a broader principle. It was, a, it was an application to a broader principle. In fact, in verse 21, I want you to listen to how Paul started off this whole concept and idea about families and how they are to, to deal with one another. It says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, see, do you see what Paul was saying? He said, uh, inside of the family, when it comes to family, moms and dads and husbands and wives and children, like the thing that you have to do is you have to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he wasn't just speaking to women, hey, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. He was teaching a broader principle that said, hey, if you really and truly want to have a great family, if you really want to have the ideal family, then the thing that you have to do is you have to be willing to mutually submit yourself one to another. And so what Paul does in the rest of the scripture is he says, husbands, here's how you're to submit yourselves. Children, this is the way you're to submit yourselves. Wives, here's how you are to submit yourselves. And he begins to unpack for us this whole concept and idea of mutual submission. And today, what I want to do just for a few moments is I want to talk about this principle of mutual submission. Because you see, mutual submission is what makes a great family. 
And in fact, many of you, if you want to have a great family, if you want to build a great family life, this is the one thing that many families don't do with one another. They don't mutually submit themselves to one another. Now, mutual submission is just simply this. When we mutually submit to one another, what I'm saying is, is I am going to leverage all of my power, all of my influence, everything that I have in order that I can come alongside and I can get up under your burden and I can help you. And so it's me saying, I'm going to take my power, I'm going to take my influence, I'm going to take my resources, and I'm going to use them in such a way that it benefits you, that it helps you in your life. And so kids submit themselves to their mom and dad, and moms and dads mutually submit themselves to their kids. And and then what the Bible says is we mutually submit ourselves one to another. So that brings up a question. It's the greatest question that I think we can ask inside of the family. And this is a question that changes everything in family life. In fact, I want you to write this question down. What can I do to help? That's the question of mutual submission. Mutual submission is me saying, hey, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? How how can I help you? Mom, how how can I help you? Dad, how can I help you? Wife, how can I help you? Kids, how can I help you? It's it's a question of mutual submission. In fact, at all of our campuses, I want us to do something. I want us to say this question out loud together, all right? On three, everybody out loud together. Say it like you mean it, okay? On three, at all the campuses. One, two, three. What can I do to help? Great job. Let's do it again. One, two, three. What can I do to help? Now, kids, teenagers, listen to me just for a second. If you go home today, don't wait two weeks from now, all right? If you go home today and you ask this question to your parents, I'm telling you, they're going to pass out. Like, like, they won't even know what to do. Like they're, 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 in fact, can I tell you something, kids? They probably don't even know what to tell you to do. They're just going to go, oh, my goodness. And your tendency is, no, 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 I'm I'm going to wait a couple of weeks from now. No, listen to me, kids. This question may actually get you in charge of the family. Like, Like if you would go home. In fact, if you want to impress your parents, listen to this. The next time your parents have some people over for dinner and everybody's gathered around, just walk into the kitchen and say, hey, mom and dad, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And when you walk off, like their friends are going to be like, These are the best parents in the entire world. Like, teach us how to parent. And you don't understand. Like, like this question is a game changer. Wives. Wives. When you ask the question to your husband, and listen, you you know know what he's going to say. You're going to say, you know, and and guys, I'm going to talk to you in just a second, but just listen to me. Wives, when you ask the question to your husband, what can I do to help? Here's what you're saying to him. It touches him in a very deep way. You're saying, hey, I understand the weight and the burden that you carry, and I know that that is difficult for you, and I want to know what can I do to leverage? What can I do to leverage my influence? What can I do to take my my, my extra time? What can I do to take the the, the power that I have and the things, the resources that I have and come up under you and help you? How how can I help you? And and so, wives, when you ask this question, it, it, it touches him deeply. And men, men, listen, dads, listen for a second. Our kids, they need us to ask this question. They want us to ask this question. Our wives, they, they, they want us to ask this question. They're waiting for us to ask this question. And men, here's the problem for most of us. Like, we're afraid to ask this question because here's what we think. We think, hey, if I ask this question, then, 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 then somebody may actually ask me to do something. And yes, she may open the closet and say, it's been sitting in here for six months and I need you to put it together. That's all I really need and you don't want to do it, but but listen to me. She wants you to ask the question and here's what you're saying as a dad because you're the leader of the family. You are saying, hey, how can I leverage my influence and my power and my time and my resources in such a way that I can help you? And guys, listen to me. This question is a question 
that makes a great family. It's when everyone in the family begins to say to each other, hey, what can I do to help? And I want to just challenge you to do this a couple of times a day. And parents, listen to me. When you come home in the evening, and I know that you've been working and life is hard, but your kids are there, and and maybe they're in their routine, and they've been doing the things that they need to do, and, and you walk in, and you look at your kids, and you say, hey, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And your kids begin to say to you, hey, mom and dad, what can, I, what can I do to help? And we begin to mutually submit ourselves one to another. Now, here's why this is so important. Because you see, this is an offer of all that I am for all that you need. And this is what builds great families. It's me saying, hey, I want you to know that as a dad, I want to leverage everything that I have. I want to to take all of my power and all of my influence, and I want to take all the resources that I have, and I want to offer them to you because I know that you might have a need in your life, and whatever I can do to help, I want to come alongside you, and I want to help you. And and so our kids listen to us, and we we say, I want to help. I want to help. And, And our families are waiting for us to say, I want to help. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? In fact, this is the greatest leadership question that I have ever learned. And, and, and we do this on staff all the time. I say to our staff members, hey, the best thing that you can do is you can just walk into a room. And, and if you're a leader, you can just look at other people and you can say, hey, let me ask you a question. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? How can I leverage my power and my resources and my time in order to help you in your time of need. Now, let me just talk about the barrier to this, all right? Here's the barrier. This is the reason that most of us do not want to ask this question. Fear, right? It's fear. We're afraid of the answer on the other side of the question. In fact, kids, you're afraid to ask this question because you know that you may be out in the yard, you know, spreading pine straw and mowing grass and picking weeds, and, and you're like, you know what, I just don't want to ask the question because I'm, I'm afraid of what they're going to ask us to do. And, and, and let, let me just say this, wives, like, like, like you're afraid to ask the question because you're afraid of the answer that you're going to get. And men, you're afraid, right? You're, you're afraid because you know that if you ask the question, she may say, hey, I need a little bit of your time. I need a little bit of your power. I need a little bit of your influence to help me. And so we're afraid, we're afraid and we're fearful that if we ask the question that we may actually have to give up our time. We may have to give up some of our resources. We may have to actually lean in and do something that we did not necessarily want to do. But let me just tell you this. Let's go back for a second and listen to what Paul said. Here's what he said. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do do, do you see what Paul is saying here? What what he's saying is, is listen, there is a fear, yes, there is a fear, but it's out of reverence for Christ that we ask this question, because guess what, people? He gave everything for us. You you see, he was willing to make a sacrifice for us. In, In fact, let me just illustrate it for you. Jesus is in heaven, and he looks at the Father, and he says this. He says, what can I do to help? And the father says, do you really want to ask that question? Yes, what can I do to help? And he says, it may cost you your life. And Jesus is like, you know what? Uh, That's okay. What can I do to help? And that means that you're going to have to go down there, and you're going to have to come second and get behind the, the back of the line, behind every person that has ever been born on planet Earth. And you're going to have to live a sinless, perfect life. And you're going to have to die on a cross. And you're going to be buried and then resurrected. And Jesus said, hey, what can... I do to help. And Paul said, you know what? Great families, Christian families, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, are the kind of families that come together and they say, hey, you know what? Out of reverence for Christ, out of reverence for what Jesus has done for us, out of reverence for the fact that he became second and and that he was willing to give his life and, and that he was willing to die on the cross for our sins, out of reverence for Christ, 
what can I do to help? And I know that it may cost me a little bit of my time, and I know that it may cost me some of my resources, and I know that it may take a little bit of my influence. But guys, can I tell you something? Listen to me very carefully. I am 99.9% sure it will not cost you your life. But it did Jesus. And you see, when it comes to submission, the problem is not that, that, that we, we sit here and say, hey, I don't want to submit. The problem is we're not doing it out of reverence for Christ. We're not looking at Christ and saying, because of what he did for us, then I am willing to submit to my wife, and I'm willing to submit to my kids, and I'm willing to ask the question of mutual submission, hey, what can I do, what can I do to help? Now, let me just go a little bit further. You see, this question forces you to lean in rather than to pull away. And, and, and men, l- l- let me just tell you something. Like, like I know for, for a lot of men, I just want to talk about this just for a second. Men, so many of you, l- let, me, let me just tell you this. You think that happiness exists because you're large and you're in charge. And, and you see, you think that as your family rotates around you, as they serve you, they, they, they want you to lean in, but you're not leaning in. And so what they do is they lean in, and they lean in, and they lean in, and they lean in. And your wife, she leans in, and she leans in, and she leans in, and eventually they fall over, and you're wondering what in the world is going on. And the reality for each and every one of us is that we think happiness is everybody else serving us. But let me just tell you the principle that Jesus wanted us to understand true happiness does not come from everyone else serving us true happiness comes from when we lean in and we begin to serve the people that are around us and can I tell you something for those of you men that are like but hold on a second I'm the leader and I'm in charge and I think that by everybody else doing what I want them to do I'm going to be happy let me just tell you something that I know about you you're not happy And you never will be happy because happiness is not about everybody else serving you. Happiness comes when we begin to give ourselves away in mutual submission to one another. So the question is, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And guys, can I tell you something? A lot of your wives, they are waiting for you. They are waiting for you to ask that question. Now, Here's what some of you are thinking. This is a question that oftentimes comes up. Well, does this mean that no one is ultimately the authority in the home? No, absolutely not. In fact, this question has nothing to do with authority. It has more to do with what you do with the authority that you've been entrusted with. You see, it's the whole idea that, hey, I'm going to do with the authority that God has given me exactly what Jesus did. And that is, I am going to serve, and I am going to submit, and I am going to mutually love those that God has placed around me. That's what I'm going to do. And the greatest example of this, guys, is Jesus. If you remember, on the night that he was in the upper room, he's the guy with all the power. He's the one that has all the influence. Influence. He's the one that has all of the resources. And on that last night, he got up and he took off his outer garment and he placed a towel over his arm and he washed the feet of his disciples. He served them. And you know what I've come to discover in life and know what I've learned about leadership really and truly? Those with the power are supposed to use it in such a way that they help those that are underneath them and those that are around them. I take my power and my influence and my resources and my time, and I begin to ask the question, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And you know what? When we begin to ask that question, it changes everything inside of our home. I want to just go back for a moment and show you this passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul tells us you submit out of what? You submit out of reverence, out of reverence for Christ. And here is what Jesus did for each and every one of us. It says, when we were utterly helpless, that is, when, when we were helpless, we couldn't do anything for ourselves, right? 
We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't help ourselves. We needed somebody's power and somebody's resources and somebody's influence to help us. So when we were utterly helpless, we couldn't do anything about the situation. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. At just the right time, he, he took his influence and his power and his resources and he leveraged them in such a way that he was willing to die for those of us that are sinners. And then Paul says this, he says, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. That, that is, most people aren't going to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is exceptionally good, right? right like people just aren't going to die for someone who's good, but maybe, maybe exceptionally good. And then listen to what he says, but God, but God, but God showed his great love for us, how much he cared about us, how much he loved us in spite of the fact that we were sinners. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ came and he died for us and he gave his life for you and me. And the question today for each and every one of us is that when we look at Jesus and we see what he has done for us, and we look at our family and we say, I want to have a great family. I want to build a great family. I want to have the ideal family. The question becomes, the question becomes, what can I do to help? Mutual submission. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he died for the church. And can I tell you, some of you are like, well, but hold on a second, Who, who's the authority? Let me just ask you this question. Over thousands of years, has anybody ever questioned Jesus being the ultimate authority over the church? People say, but, 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 but he died. Yeah, that's right. That's why he's the authority. He gave himself. He died for us. And the only way the only way that we can ever build a great family is when, as a family, we come together and we say, hey, you know what? We're going to serve one another. Kids, mom and dad, what can I do to help? Mom and dad, to the kids, hey, hey, what, what can I do to help? Dad, to your son, what can I do to help? To your wife, what can I do to help? And we do it out of reverence. For what Christ has done for us. Let's pray together. Every head bowed and every eye closed on all of our campuses. I know today that God probably has been speaking to some of you through the power of his Holy Spirit. And you know that, that in your heart right now, the Spirit of God is just leaning in and saying, you know what? This would be a game changer for your family. If we would just learn to submit ourselves to one another and begin to ask the question, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And in this moment, I just want you to just take a moment and just say to God, God, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you that why I was helpless and I couldn't do anything for myself, you submitted yourself for me. You gave yourself for me. And in the same way, God, I want to mutually submit for my family. And just help me this week, Lord. Help me this week to be able to ask the question, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, some of you, maybe today, this is your first time at North Star. Maybe you've been coming for a while. And as we read that passage of Scripture about God's incredible love for you, Maybe the problem in your life for mutual submission is that you've never submitted yourself to God. You've never opened your heart and your life up for a relationship with him. And today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that because here's the deal. You will never be able to do it out of reverence until first you begin to follow him. Pastor Marty, how do I do that? It's really simple. All you have to do is just say to God, God, I am a sinner. And while I was helpless, you came and you died for me. And in the best way I know how, I just simply want to surrender my heart and my life to you right now. Would you please come in and be the Lord and the Savior of my life? 
Thank you, God, for loving me. And Jesus, thank you so much for dying for me. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if you just prayed that prayer, the greatest prayer of your life, and at all of our campuses, I would just love the privilege and the opportunity to be able to pray for you before you leave. And I'm going to ask you to do something very bold and very brave. I do nothing to embarrass you, but with every head bowed and every eye closed on all of our campuses, if you just prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand? Thank you, and God bless you. God bless you. Someone else, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. On all of our campuses, there you go. You can put it down now, and I want to pray for you right now. Father, thank you for those today, for the first time, who are saying yes to Jesus. They're saying they want to surrender their life to your authority, God, to your leadership. And I pray that, God, you would come alongside and encourage and strengthen them as they begin to grow in their relationship with you. We celebrate, and God, we thank you for the decisions that are made. For God, we love you, we praise you, and we ask, God, that you would help us to ask the question this week, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? For we pray and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey, North Star, let's put our hands together and celebrate all those who are committing their life to Christ today. Amen. Man, that, that's awesome. Hey, I just want um, just a few moments. We're going to receive the offering. But before we do, um, I just want to kind of give you a couple of, of, of instructions. Um, for those of you that maybe committed your life to Christ today, if you would just turn over on the back of your connection card and just check off, hey, today I'm committing my life to Christ. We're not going to come by your house, show up on your front doorstep. But I just simply would like to send you some information this week that will help you to know how you can grow in your relationship with Jesus. Um, and you can just drop that in the offering bucket here in just a few moments when we receive the offering. Please don't pass the buckets yet. Hey, if you're a first-time guest, we don't want you to give anything. We're just glad that you're here. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, before we receive the offering, um, if you would turn your attention towards North Star News.